invited to be opening our one day symposium on decolonizing criminology, reckoning with the legacy and impact of colonial thought on criminological discourse, crime and punishment. Now we're going to begin to, by acknowledging that the land, the land that we inhabit, the land that we're standing on, that we know to be New York City, is the homeland of the Lenape, who were violently displaced as a result of European settler colonialism. And we pledge to engage with the history of genocide, forced removal, exclusion, and to work to confront the continuing legacy of this today, both in the United States and in other colonial settler societies. In doing so, what we, we want to do is to obviously confront our own presence on these lands and to do what we can to push for change. It's, it's significant that, in, in Walter, as Walter Johnson argues, in the broken heart of America, that the removal of the country's indigenous peoples is, as he says, it's fundamentally about controlling the future. It's about determining what sorts of people will be allowed to live and in what sorts of places. It is symptomatic of a history of racial capitalism. And it is a history that, as he says, that has at its core imperial dispossession and capitalist exploitation. And it is this distress that was made possible by the taking of indigenous lands. It was made possible, it made possible the justification of slavery, the justification of slavery in a republic that was founded under that rubric of equality. And of course, it justified the maintenance of that distinction between the deserving and the undeserving poor that continues to this day. New York City, our city, is a city that's built on the lands of the indigenous peoples. It's built with the unfreed labor of enslaved black people. It's built on the backs of the poor. This means for many people, this country for them has been a different America to that portrayed in the early manuscripts of, the, of America's foundations. And of course, in much of mainstream culture over the years. Likewise, when we think about criminology and the history of criminology, we have to acknowledge that this history is not an easy one because it's a history of silencing and exclusion. The dominant theories of crime largely emerge from Northern European societies and consequently the links to an exclusionary world order and a colonial past are inescapable. But criminology has been affected by what Paul Rock described as a chronocentrism, a myopic take on the past, in which we tend to, often to many people tend to forget continuities. We forget the history of the discipline. We forget the stain of dangerous knowledge on people and communities. We're here in John Jay College of Criminal Justice. We have to acknowledge the complex history of John Jay. John Jay College is named in honor of the fa founding father, John Jay, who was US first chief justice of the Supreme Court. He was also an owner of multiple people as slaves. John Jay's Slavery Records Index Project, which is directed by Judy Lee Peters and Ned Benton, shows that John Jay to have owned at least 17 people as slaves. He used their services, he rented them out to work or sold them on to other people. We have to confront this complex history. When we consider criminology, if we think about criminological textbooks and we look at how they start with those foundational theories, the foundational theories of classicism and positivism, we have to look about you know, what do these mean and what legacies they have left with us. Of any theory, classicism's history is the largest and it continues to exert a profound influence not only on criminological debate, but on institutions of social control. Classicism emerging out of the Enlightenment 
and those ideas of collectivism, the we, the people, freedom, equality, fraternity. Well, for many people, these ideals have been a hollow myth. The Enlightenment, classicist ideas, what did they actually represent? What actually happened? Well, really what they translated into was a revolutionary and transnational proclivity to advance across borders. They created a stranglehold on ideas and how ideas are put into practice in the global north and parts of the global south. Who was it, we have to ask, who was that we actually party to the social contract? The impact of classicism, classicist ideas, was considerable in shaping legal and penal systems of administration. And we must never forget when we think about criminology that it started and is today a largely policy-oriented discipline. So its theoretical origins have and continue to have a tremendous impact on communities and those people who find themselves as labeled as criminals or as potential criminals, we must never lose sight of that. So here, if we think about New York City, if we look at the writings, for example, of Thomas Eddy in the late 1700s and early 1800s, Thomas Eddy is very significant because he founded the penitentiary system here in New York. His writings are full of reference to Beccaria's on crimes and punishment, to the work of Jeremy Bentham, John Howard, and other Enlightenment figures. The result of his ideas, well, they first they led to the building of penitentiaries, first in Greenwich Village here in the city, and then where Bellevue Hospital is today. But the legacy of this was mass incarceration. The legacy was the Rikers Island jail complex as we know it today. It meant that we can't, it's very difficult for us, as Angela Davis has said, to actually see beyond incarceration, see beyond the prison system, and to move beyond it. If we look at that other foundational theory, positivism, and those assumptions over individual predisposition to criminality, as perpetuated by Lombroso and his colleagues in the late 1800s and early 1900s. These ideas presented race as a determining factor, racial characteristics as indicative of criminality, of what Lombroso described as atavism, equating that to the born criminal. What these ideas did was infuse racism into the discipline of criminology. They contributed to the development of scientific racism, which led to the eugenicist movement and the horrors of the Holocaust. It resulted in the othering and the dehumanization of people and communities. It provided, these ideas provided the justification for keeping people outside of the social contract. Because by presenting the other as they did, as primitive, as lawless, as uncivilized, colonialism was thus seen to be justified and the other, those who were seen as the other, still liable for tyrannical rule. And positivism, that search for causal factors, remains a dominant paradigm within criminology. And what these foundational theories were to ignore were the crimes of the powerful, the crimes of the elites, the crimes of colonialism, of genocide, of war, of the state. They helped to secure national identities. They helped to build up nation states. And it is in part this history that we have come together today to try to confront, to confront the complex legacy of these ideas. And that the legacy of colonialism and decolonization has to take center stage. So our attention here today is to interrogate this past, it is to reckon with the present. It is to interrupt the curriculum. And it is to present challenges for the future. And I hope that, you know, this is why I said this is going to be the start of an ongoing conversation about how we do this. Now, this symposium is, is actually the culmination of several years of discussion um, with, with Marcia Esparza and Albert de la Terra, who are the co-organizers. 
and our colleagues and comrades in the Social Change and Transgressive Studies Project, the Historical Memory Project, um, Brooklyn College's Policing and Social Justice Project, and the Critical Criminology Workshop Series of the Graduate Center. And as I said, I hope this will be the start of many discussions around these themes. And we are today so very honored to have such wonderful speakers, such amazing guest speakers. You know, when people play that game of who would you invite to your dream dinner party, if I was to say, who would I invite to my dream symposium? I think we've got it, actually. It would be Vico Agazzino. Um, whose groundbreaking book, Counter-Colonial Criminology, and of course his many other writings, have had such a profound influence, on, certainly on myself, and I know many people in this room, you know, how he tackled that terrible history of criminology and the legacy of those ideas, some of which I've just alluded to. Vivian, Vivian Saleh Hanna, who I first heard talk at the American Society of Criminology, which for those of you who have been to the ASA, know that it can be somewhat challenging in terms of progressive ideas. But when I heard Vivian talk, you know, how she was trying to push the discipline forward, how she was pushing feminist thought forward in so many ways, was, was quite extraordinary and, and, and inspiring. And then Nigel South, a founder of Green Criminology. Nigel's work forces us to confront definitions of crime, the connections between past, present, and future harms, and how those legacies of colonialism, the violence of war, the state, intersectionality, environmental, and, and in the eco side are all connected. So, as I said, it brings me great pleasure to open this symposium today. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. And, um, I hope we're going to have a very productive day of talks. So I'm now going to hand you over. Oh, to is it Dan's <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, we a slight change in our schedule. <laughs> when we. So where's Nick, would you like to, um, I'm going to hand over actually to Nick Rodrigo, who is going to introduce our first speaker, Vico Agazzino. I wrote a little uh, introduction, but everything I was going to say, Jane basically <laughs> just said. So I'll, uh, I'll say it again anyway. Uh, my name is Nick Rodrigo. I'm at, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm an adjunct professor here at uh, John Jay College. I'm also a graduate center PhD candidate. I wanted to start with uh, what Patrick Wolf uh, reminds us of, and that is that settler colonialism is a system rather than a historical event that perpetuates the erasure and destruction of native peoples as a precondition for settler colonialism and expropriation of land and resources. Today, this system of erasure and destruction acquires its normative acceptance, not from the GOP or Fox News, which constitute a twin-headed racist attack dog for corporate America, nor does it receive mainstream credence from the burgeoning well-armed far-right groups and legions of fascist trolls and incels stalking the cyberspace, but of course they reproduce a lot of this discourse. Colonial logic center of reproduction in the contemporary era, and in fact, as my comrade Professor Mooney pointed out in the introduction, for quite some time now, lie in academia. From international relations to cultural anthropology to sociology, the world is seen as a global order of neatly ordered territorial states where tribes and communities are primed for callous investigation and where Spanish is an other language in a nation state built on the violent imposition of English. Although the field of post-colonial studies has strove to decolonize these fields of knowledge, racialized othering and the hierarchialization of forms and contents of knowledge, sorry, 
racialized othering and the hierarchicalized forms and contents of knowledge continue to shape the contours of the disciplines of the social sciences and the humanities. Within one discipline where this has dramatic effects on the real world is criminology, which is still wedded to the problematic ideas rooted in white supremacy and colonialism. Mass incarceration and the expansion and sophistication of contemporary policing powers are but a few societal problems that are rooted partly in criminology's inability to shed its colonial moorings. However, not all is lost. There has been, in recent years, developments in decolonial criminology. The shining light of these developments emanate not from the moth-eaten, slave-trade-funded Ivy League institutions of America, but in the hearts and minds of our fearless colleagues in the Global South, where the cost risk of challenging the penal police state is far starker than anything we face. It is more than just tenure that is up for grabs. To delve deeper into the paradigm of decolonialism, in criminology, I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Onwabiku Agozino, a professor of sociology at Virginia Tech. He's a scholar activist who values inclusive excellence and diversity with critical attention focused on people of African descent and other marginalized groups around the world. He emphasizes race, class, and gender issues in his contribution to learning, discovery, and community engagement beyond the boundaries of the classroom, and he'll be speaking on the paradigm of um, decolonialism and criminology. So I guess we'll the stage. Thanks for this very wonderful introduction and for the invitation to this forum to meet so many people attending an academic presentation is such a joy to me, especially academic presentation from people like us who think unconventionally within the mainstream. My topic today is on the decolonization paradigm in criminology. And this is a paradigm that developed consciously and deliberately in graduate school in Scotland, where I did my research on black women and the criminal justice system. And I became quickly aware that, thank you, a lot of the theories in criminology did not address the specific conditions that black women were going through, and this could be generalized to other populations who have been who have been discriminated against and victimized within the criminal justice system. I start with the assumption that criminology is deeply implicated in colonialism and imperialism because it is a discipline that developed at the height of colonial conquest and a discipline that was deliberately designed for the control of others, racial and ethnic others, but also gendered others and class others within Europe itself. And this was revealed to me with a study of black women and the criminal justice system, which then continued to influence my work, including what Jane said earlier about kind of colonial criminology, a critique of imperialist reason. At the time I was writing, I didn't think that decolonization would become mainstream, but colleagues are now saying it is mainstream. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying, oh no, I thought it would remain at the margins of cutting edge of critical thinking. But today you find decolonization being emphasized in almost every discipline from geography to anthropology, even sociology. So criminology cannot continue to hide from the need 
to decolonize the discipline, especially one that is deeply... <laughs> deeply implicated in colonialism and imperialism itself, criminology is. What I found in criminology, especially in the work of one of my supervisors, David Garland, is a focus on the punishment of offenders. These are the first four words in his, hi David. <laughs> um, not this David, the other David. <laughs> First four words in his influential text, punishment and modern society, the punishment of offenders. And he defined criminology as a search for better ways of punishing offenders. Whereas in my research, I found that black women who were completely innocent, were treated as if they were offenders simply because they were closed approximate to suspected black men. And I didn't find that kind of association or guilt by association with any other group that I looked at. So I call that the poo theory, the punishment of offenders, poo. Uh, and because I was raising a toddler when I was writing my dissertation, having a poo theory immediately suggested to me we need a party theory, the punishment of the innocent. Um, and that's what I was observing with the black women. They were being punished, but everybody knew they were innocent and criminology had nothing to say about it because criminology focused almost exclusively on the punishment of offenders. I also grew up as a survivor of a major genocide the foundation of genocide in post-colonial Africa, the Biafra genocide, as some of you may have heard about. 3.1 million people were killed in 30 months with weapons generously su supplied by the Labour Party government of Harold Wilson, who bragged that if he took 500,000 of our people dead to achieve his aim, that he was going to accept that, but it was 3.1 million in 30 months. And they were killed mostly through the use of starvation as a legitimate weapon of war, according to the Nigerian government. I'm happy to note that one of our hosts today, Marcia Esparza, looks at this very forgotten or neglected issue in criminology. You go through many criminology textbooks and you will never see a word about genocide. For me, it is an academic because I survived it and maybe because of my childhood survival of this tragedy, I was committed early on to adhere to nonviolent resolution of conflicts at the interpersonal, but also national and international levels. And what I noticed therefore was the need for a paradigm shift from, away from what is known today as the punitive turn in criminology following the work of David Gallen. Because Gallen had written that very first book on punishment and welfare to talk about the bifurcation thesis of Anthony Bottoms to say that in the law, it isn't only punishment that is given out, that also welfare is given out by the state. And that Foucault recognizes by talking about not just punishment, but discipline and punish. But in 1990, about five years later, he then came out with punishment and modern society, a review of all the theories of punishment, announcing indirectly the punitive turn in criminological theory with a focus on punishment. But from my own experience and my research, we need to move away from the punitive turn because that's not the only option available to us as a society responding to wrongful behavior. We also have the tradition of forgiveness, the forgiveness of the unforgivable, as Derrida put it. 
it's a tradition that ordinarily is traced to the religions of the book. The Abrahamic tra traditions, each one of them emphasizes forgiveness in their teaching. From Judaism, during, during their new year, they would have the prayer to forgive what is done by their brothers and friends against them, except for that which is unforgivable. So they have an exception. And the Christians also preach that you should turn the other cheek, except when you come to the last book of the Christian tradition, which is Revelation, when it is time for a payback and no more forgiveness in the book of Revelations and in Islam, you're encouraged to forgive your enemies so that on the judgment day, you will also be forgiven your own sins or wrongdoing, except when they repeat the wrongdoing and therefore it becomes unforgivable. Derrida said that, strangely enough, people of African descent have practiced a different tradition, that is the forgiveness of the unforgivable. How can people of African descent go through 400 years of being enslaved, a major crime against humanity, but they're not looking for revenge. How could we in Biafra survive a major genocide that claimed 3.1 million lives in 30 months, and we're not looking for revenge? The Igbo in Nigeria, I'm dressed like an Igbo today. That's how we dress formally. It's like a suit. We're not looking for revenge. How could black South Africans go through apartheid and come out with truth and reconciliation rather than the punitive model of justice that the Nuremberg principles established for dealing with genocide? Derrida said that's the forgiveness of the unforgivable. But Desmond Tutu and Mfo Tutu, his daughter, said there is no such thing as the unforgivable in the African tradition of Ubuntu. Everybody deserves to be forgiven something and there is nothing that is unforgivable because the forgiveness is not really for the offender exclusively, it's also for us to help us to heal and overcome. Otherwise we will remain prisoners to the pain and harm done to us by the offenders. So that's the paradigm shift away from the punitive turn towards the reparative justice model. And this is found in the ancient African tradition or philosophy of Maat, the goddess of justice in ancient Egypt. And if you go through the work of Karenga, Maulana Karenga and Molefi Asante and many others, including Vivian, who's with us here today, you'll find an emphasis on forgiveness as a way to treat most offenses, even when they are completely unforgivable in your mind. You know, like Joseph being sold into slavery by the brothers, that's the first time the word forgiveness is mentioned in the Bible within the context of forgiving his brothers. If, I, if I'm not mistaken. So we need to make that paradigm shift by also decolonizing victimization from the empire of punishment because the punitive turn is really expanding the conceptual coverage of punishment beyond what is recognizable as the punishment of offenders. Right on the street, the word is that if people do something to you that is unjustified, undeserved, it's not called punishment, it's called victimization. And so when the state does the same thing by treating you as if you were an offender, under the philosophy or empire of punishment, that's actually what Dworkin calls it, the empire of law that commands you to do 
or not to do something. It's an empire. But we, in criminology, view this as something that individuals do to other individuals or groups do to other groups. We never really conceptualize victimization as something that the state does to people. So if you look at the bifurcation thesis of Anthony Bottoms that Garland expanded on in punishment and welfare, you find there are only two fingers. But when you add victimization, you find there are three fingers in the triptych for of the devil. Victimization as mere punishment needs to be decolonized from the widening empire of punishment so that we can use reparative justice to address the wrongs done to innocent people, especially by the state and by corporations, but also by powerful individuals. In the theoretical background, you'll find that there are competing models. So on the one hand, you have Franz Fanon and Edward Said, talking about the crimes of imperialism and colonization and how to continue the struggle for decolonization. Fanon will tell us again and again that, the decolon that decolonization is always a violent affair. And for this, people have blamed Fanon for being the apostle of violence. But if we step back a bit and we recognize that Fanon was a psychiatrist who treated people who were mentally unwell, then he wasn't prescribing violence. He was describing violence. He was trying to diagnose the causes of violence. And if you knew the causes, maybe you would be better able to prevent it. And colonialism being a major cause of violence, well, decolonization is part of the efforts by society to respond to the harm caused by victimization. In my view, I might be wrong. And this is supported by Edward Said in Culture and Imperialism, where he said that Fanon remains the model for the study of the violence done by colonizers, especially now that there is concerted effort to recolonize the world according to Edward Said in Culture and Imperialism. We should go and read Fanon again, he said, rather than Foucault. He said we shouldn't really go to Foucault for a theory of colonial violence because Foucault never touched it. And he said we shouldn't go to Jürgen Habermas either because Habermas completely ignored it. And both Foucault and Habermas would say, well, we did because we weren't talking about a history, a big history of the world. We were talking about the history of modern Europe. But Said said, even if you're talking about the history of modern Europe, there's no way you're going to ignore what Europe has done all over the world. And David Garland, although he's critical of Foucault, because Foucault writes as if anything that is designed for social control actually works as social control, functions as such. But I think Garland was influenced to some extent by Foucault in his own work. And maybe that is why we get the poor theory from him. But something did happen um, well, I, I guess maybe I shouldn't be too hard on Habermas because Habermas rejected the prize given to him by a government in the Gulf that violates human rights. So we should give him a bit of a pass there for, for doing that. But if you go to the theory of communicative action, you find that Habermas is reporting from colonial anthropologists as if it is a fact that African communication systems are pre-civilizational. What does he mean by that, pre-civilizational? Given that Africa is the cradle of human civilization, how could African modes of communication be regarded as pre-civilizational? So, Habermas wasn't completely silent on Africa, 
but he was silent on colonialism and anti-colonial struggles. And in the case of Foucault, maybe because he was focused on the microphysics of power, talking about colonialism is a macrophysics of power and therefore would contradict some of the theories that he was trying to develop. The more recent work by colleagues in Australia and New Zealand, especially by Blag, Anthony, uh, Blag and Anthony, Harry Blag and Anthony wrote Decolonizing Criminology, a book that I recommend because it focused on the treatment of indigenous people in Australia and the need to move away from the Eurocentric model of the punishment of offenders to recognize generational and centuries old victimization of the indigenous people by settler colonialism. And also by Kunin and Tori who wrote indigenous criminology, making similar arguments. And I'm happy to say that both texts and uh, all those colleagues have recognized my contribution to this emerging paradigm of decolonization in criminology. Well, you might be asking me in your mind, what are the political implications? It's all right to write books and articles on decolonizing criminology, but what does it really mean in practice when people are facing repression under the criminal justice system? So one political implication I've already mentioned is that we, we actually do not always punish. Even in the Western societies, we also forgive a lot. Okay, so that's one implication. Uh, another implication is that we can use reparative justice, not only punitive justice, even when we move against people who have done harm. We can try to repair some of the damage done to the people who are victimized. But in this reparative justice, there wasn't a lot of interest among criminologists, except when they talk about restorative justice by an individual giving back to another individual, not by the state, not by the corporation or powerful offenders. But in 2012, 2013, there was a historic case in London where survivors of the Mau Mau Gulag in Kenya sued the British government and they used the work done by a historian, Carol, Carol Elkins, uh, talked about the British Gulag in Kenya. And the survivors took the book and went to court and said, yeah, here's the evidence, now we want reparations. And Carol Elkins, a professor at Harvard University, history program was called as an expert witness. And you guessed, no criminologist was called to be an expert witness because we're not interested in stuff like that. We're still doing poo theory. Another political implication is today's date is 420. 420 is the day honoring the legalization of marijuana. Right? Why were people being sent to prison for using something that doctors said was medicinal, whereas the state that is criminalizing mostly colored people provides subsidies to people who grow tobacco, and tobacco kills millions of people worldwide every year, about six million every year. Not only is it legal, it is all subsidized with taxpayers' money. So today, we recognize an achievement by the decolonization paradigm by the fact that many states, many jurisdictions around the world have come around to bow to pressure from the grassroots, from the people, from the communities to say, back off. 
because we know from scientific research that marijuana is the safest drug known to humanity. It's safer than alcohol. It's actually 1,000 times safer than alcohol. And alcohol is perfectly legal if you're of age. How come you are jailing our people more than any other group for marijuana? We don't use marijuana more than other groups. But we are being targeted and criminology completely was silent on this stuff. But in my doctoral dissertation and my friends warned me I was gonna fail for saying that, I said, why are you jailing black women in the UK for drugs offenses? About 90% or more of the black women in prison when I was doing my research, we are there for drugs offenses. At the same time, whenever a British woman was arrested in Thailand and sentenced to death, the prime minister would fly over there and free her and bring her back home. Imagine that it was white women from Europe who were being arrested and jailed in Africa at the same proportion that black women were being jailed in the UK for drugs. Those drugs wouldn't be illegal for a minute they would have been legalized and Britain would have gone to war against African countries. Remember they fought the opium war against China for the right to sell opium. Even though China said, we'll buy your opium and throw them in the sea. They said, that's not enough. We want to bring more, we want to sell more. So the withering away of marijuana law is part of the political implications of the decolonization paradigm. Criminologists need to embrace this more and advocate for it more than we are doing at the moment. The withering away of the law is one of the theories that David Gallan reviewed in Punishment and Modern Society, looking at the work of Pashukanis in Russia, where he traced this theory from Engels and Marx to Lenin to say that when there is a communist society, when the law will emphasize taking from all according to their abilities and giving to all according to their needs, there will be no more need for criminal law. Rather, there will be administrative law, administration of things, rather than punishment of individuals. But Gallant concluded that this is only, uh, uh, if you like uh, a thought experiment, because there is no place in the world where the law is withering away and the state is withering away. But we can see with marijuana law uh, withering away that this is actually possible, capital punishment withering away. And that is what uh, I'm happy to say David Greenberg and I collaborated on to help to advocate for the withering away of the death penalty because it is not a deterrent. It is, in fact, something that brutalizes the conscience of the societies in which the death penalty is retained. Right. Another political implication is the demand around the world for the defunding of militarized policing. The text that Chris Kunin has just released, defund the police. It's not an issue only for Black Lives Matter. It's not an issue only for black people. This is how I get my white students to think more critically about it because they think Black Lives Matter is an issue only for black students. I say, well, do you know that the cops in America kill more white people than they kill black people? They say, get away from here. I say, go look it up in Washington Post. About half all the people killed every year by cops in America are white. Only about 25% are black. And the other 25% are Hispanic and American Indian natives. It's only proportionately higher for black people. But in real numbers, in raw numbers, more white folks are getting killed by cops, but they think it's only a problem for black people. And when white people come out to support Black Lives Matter, they think they're doing work of charity for which they should be praised. I said, no, it's not charity. You really need to. The cops don't respect you because you're white. They kill white people too, honestly. 
Okay. Finally, there are gaps in the decolonization paradigm as it is emerging. And one of the major gaps is the lack of activism within criminology generally. And therefore, if criminology will embrace the decolonization paradigm, we should also bear in mind that it's not just publishing to get promotions and tenure, it is also risking your job by saying things that could get you fired, you know, like legalize it, which I was saying in my doctoral dissertation, and I'm happy the word is coming around to that, that call today. So we should be more activist in our criminology. We should borrow a leaf from Africana studies. We are, I am also located at Virginia Tech, where the emphasis is on scholar activism or intellectual activism, not just scholarship. We should borrow from Africana studies in that sense, so that in the future, we will not say that journalists are the best criminologists. That is a warning that we got from Charles Wright Mills that sociologists are the, you know, journalists are the best sociologists because sociologists are busy developing grand theory and abstracted empiricism that has nothing to do with the biographies of individuals. Although in the case of C.W. Mills, he never talked about racism. He never talked about sexism. He only focused on the power elite. And he wrongly concluded that the power elites were the ones who determined all the changes in society, whereas the masses of the people were manipulated and had no power. If Charles Wright Mills was involved in the civil rights movement that was raging at that time as an activist, he wouldn't have come to that conclusion. So activism will actually make you better criminologists, make us better sociologists. And I, I want to thank my colleague Gabby Dunn at uh, Penn State University for paying very close attention to my work and reviewing counter-colonial criminology in very many pages in his book and linking it to the Fanonian theory of the colonial model. The difference between kind of colonial criminology and the colonial model is that kind of colonial criminology focuses directly on decolonization rather than simply stating that African Americans and other minorities in the US live under conditions similar to colonialism in Africa, we should be addressing how to decolonize that situation. Uh, another colleague in Australia did a blog for the American Society of, no, for the British Society of Criminology, where she said that she is against decolonial criminology uh, but unfortunately, she cited me as one of those who do decolonial criminology, but I never use that word decolonial in my work. And I do not accept that we should call what we are doing decolonial because as Talk and Yang emphasized in their 2012 article, influential article, Decolonization is not a metaphor. But we see descendants of settler colonialism from the South, people like Walter Mignolo, saying that we shouldn't even use the word decolonization, that it's not acceptable to them that we should simply talk about the decolonia. And I'm saying to us that we shouldn't confuse the linguistic turn that is known as the decolonial turn with the urgent practical task of decolonization, a struggle that is still ongoing today. A word that Mignolo doesn't even use in, his, in some of his work, that is decolonization. It's a challenge for us to do that. So I will leave it at that and I expect that you will challenge me, question me, and force me to clarify some of my 
initial remarks. Thank you very much for having me. Is there a roving mic or? Oh, no. Um, because I'm the chair, I get to ask you the first question. Uh, so. I haven't been in this room since before COVID. And whenever I'm in here, I'm always reminded of um, a quote by the, because, you know, there's these huge skyscrapers. We're facing west into the interior of the United States, right? I'm always reminded of this uh, quote by the Cuban revolutionary Jose Marti when he was traveling around the United States. He mentions he's writing a letter home and he's, he's saying, you know, I'm in the belly of the beast and I know the monster and my sling is that of David. And I think most people who have like a critical approach to criminology understand that they're in the belly of the beast and it's their role to sort of hold a mirror up to this country. Um, I'm wondering, because you mentioned a lot of the exciting work that's happening outside of the belly of the beast in the global south. And maybe this should be a question that should be posited at the end of the day, um, but maybe I'll forget it. Um, what can those within the belly of the beast do with those in the global south? How can we create act, maybe activist connections, but also intellectual connections? Um, and I also was wondering if you could share some of the exciting work that's happening maybe in, in Nigeria, but also in other countries in Africa and in the global south and how that can be connected back to us here in New York. Oh, thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you very much for that question. It's a challenging question of what we can do to advance decolonization. The belly of the beast is not just in the US, it is global. There is nowhere you can go in the world and say you are outside the whale, maybe Nineveh, but uh, where Jonah was uh, spat out but we are all in the belly of the beast. And what Jose Mate was saying can actually be illustrated with the Cuban revolution. Can you imagine a country in which people invade your country with arms, trying to kill people to overthrow your government? You defeat them, arrest all of them, and then you send them all back home. That's what Cuba did with the Bay of Pigs invasion. But Cuba has also gone beyond that to support the struggle against apartheid in Africa, in South Africa. It was as a result of the Cuban intervention that apartheid was forced to end at the cost of more than 2,000 Cuban lives. They went to defend Angola when South Africa invaded Angola to install a puppet regime because they said the Angolan government was a socialist government at the time that the US was supporting South Africa and supporting the rebels in Angola. Cuba, a very small country, hasn't got a lot of resources, went there to risk lives to defend the principle of the right to self-determination by anybody anywhere in the world. So the short answer to your question is that we should ask ourselves as professors in criminology, what is it that we teach our students that makes it possible for them to graduate and say, I want to be a cop. I want to be a correctional officer or go into police to politics to become a dictator, a tyrant. This, this is the kind of stuff that Plato produced from the school of Athens. This, the graduates from the school of Athens, we are tyrants, even with all that philosophical training. So there must be something we are doing wrong in criminology and in criminal justice that exposes us all to training dictators and authoritarian personalities. Because when you pause to think about, I mentioned Carol Elkins, she is not a sociologist or a criminologist, a historian. 
And then you go to Africa, you find mathematicians being more interested in criminology than people who are trained in criminology in Africa. That's, I mean, I'm talking about somebody in Nigeria called Edwin Madnagu, a Marxist theoretician, but he's a mathematician. And what he does is to question the large number of crimes committed by corporations and by the state in Nigeria. No criminologist is doing that kind of work. You can also bring it to here in the US. Okay, I guess I'm turning off the people who want to be criminal justice. <laughs> I think they've, I think they've got a class. They got a class, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to go and convert their class members. To <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Away from being cops. No, no, but we should respect the career choices of our students. And we hope that some of you, when you are powerful cops, will take some of these lessons and treat your fellow citizens, yes, with compassion rather than with the punitive turn only. Because we know that very many of them are not offenders. They are not guilty of a crime. They're innocent. They, they treated as though they were guilty. So that's one thing we would need to do. We need to challenge the disciplinary boundaries of criminology. We need to make it open, more open for people who are coming from the humanities and maybe even from the STEM disciplines to participate in this discipline because it's a discipline that is concerned with human rights, with the kind of logic that made Muhammad Ali to say, I'm not going to Vietnam to fight. I have no beef with people in Vietnam. Why should I go fight them? Or Martin Luther King Jr. to say to us that the Vietnamese and the Americans live under one roof, the word house. The white and the black South Africans live under one roof, the word house. The Southern whites and the African Americans live under one roof that was gifted to us by our ancestors. And it's up to us to fight and burn it down, or we can come together to build a beloved community here in the US. And Martin Luther King Jr. was not a criminologist. Malcolm X, who was born, was it yesterday? Happy birthday, Malcolm was not a criminologist. Muhammad Ali was not a criminologist. And they had such wonderful ideas about how to run a society that criminologists wouldn't have because we are trained to lock people away and throw away the key. That's not enough in, in the modern world. Uh, that would be my short answer to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I bet you have a um, we'll go for it. Should we take the round of three? Okay. Okay, so, we, okay, so we'll go a gentleman here yeah. and then Danny and then uh, Alex at the... Biko, thanks for a really interesting and expansive presentation. Much appreciated. I wanted to really uh, ask you about your theme around uh, the withering of the state and that kind of transitional period that perhaps you suggest that we are, are going through now. And um, you mentioned uh, Marx, actually, uh, at, that, at that point. And um, I think uh, Marx, when he was writing on the Jewish question, mm -hmm. talked about um, state security as a, as a priority of civil society. Mm -hmm. So what kind of proposals do you, do you have for um, state security in a, in a process of a, a withdrawal, but a, a positive withdrawal of the state? Oh, we're going to take it okay. down. I've written down. Yes, well, okay. Said so you don't okay. So Thank you, Paul. Would you be able to pass the microphone on to the, and then Alex just at the... Um, thank you so much for... Uh, raising more questions than I've heard in a long time at a criminology discussion. Um, I was confused about your comments about Fanon and, and because my understanding of Fanon is he certainly describes the violence 
of colonialism, but then posits the necessity of violence in response. And I want to ask that in relationship to forgiveness, because forgiveness, as far as I can tell, can only occur once the conditions of oppression and exploitation have ended. Otherwise, you're forgiving something that continues. Mm -hmm. And in South Africa, when we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the state has now created a, a, a new formation, but one that doesn't end the violence of capitalism and the domination and exploitation of uh, the people who were colonized. So thinking about Fanon, when is violence necessary? And when is forgiveness um, not possible because the precondition is the precondition of forgiveness, transformation, and justice? Interesting. Mm -hmm. And just one more after that. Then we'll take another round after. That okay. About time, I'm not sure. Hi, uh, Alex Vitali. Um, you mentioned uh, Chris Kaneen's new book on defund the police, looks at it at a global scale, which is great, but I'm wondering what, what you think the sort of status is of police and prison abolitionist thought in the global south and how this fits into your decolonizing framework. It's okay, it's okay, I got it. Thank you, thank you all, very challenging questions. The very first question about state security from Marx refers us to a distinction between the socialist state and the capitalist state. So the capitalist state has to be smashed, according to Marx, has to be overthrown by the working people, and they will have to build a socialist state that they will defend. However, the defense of the socialist state would not have to depend on the same methods and tactics of the capitalist state. The best defense that the socialist state would have would be to serve the needs of the people. So social security is, or economic security for the people, is actually what makes for a secure state in the view of Marx and Lenin. And that is what some people say the Chinese government is trying to do by avoiding going to war to build an empire for trade. They seem to have come to the conclusion that the best security for their state is to meet the basic needs of the people and produce surpluses for trade around the world. So that was the point that Lenin is making in State and Revolution that <clears throat> the bourgeois state will have to be abolished, but that the socialist state will then have to wither away gradually, <laughs> gradually until we come to a communist state where the state would itself wither away and we will no longer have a state. That would be the case globally if we can meet all the needs of our people in every part of the world, then there will be no need for border, militarized border control that commit a lot of people to be killed or drowned trying to escape from severe poverty or violence in the global south. That can actually be done. You know, the borders of the US can be removed if the conditions are ripe for such so that we can go back to the indigenous people's organization of the state which had no borders, no need for visas, no need for an international passport to travel. And they were able to run very well secure societies for thousands of years before they were colonized and subjected to Euro modernism. Uh, and that brings me to the second question about Fanon talking about the necessity for violence under certain conditions. And yes, Fanon said, if somebody's trying to punch you in the nose, you have every right to defend yourself, right? However, if you want to prevent such violence, like a native grabbing a kitchen knife and running down the street and screaming, I want to kill the man, kill the man, 
a, a slogan of the Black Panthers here in America, you know, kill the man was a slogan used by the Panthers, but what they meant was to kill the man in your head that is telling you you are less beautiful, you are less smart, and you are less deserving of respect. You gotta kill that man in your head to recognize that you are equal to any other human being. And you only do it by reading the books of Fanon, by reading critical books, not by going out to commit violence, because every time our people grab a knife and they want to commit violence, they're not going after the enemy, they're going after the loved ones at home. They're going after the brothers for a very small slight. Same thing all over Africa. Every time you arm Africans with these weapons manufactured by Europeans and flooded into Africa, they're not killing any white person with that. It, I'm not saying they should, because many of the white people are our allies and our comrades in the struggle for decolonization. But they're killing people like me, kids, running around in Biafra trying to save our lives. And they're dropping bombs with Russian MiG jets and the spraying bullets supplied generously by Harold Wilson from the UK. That isn't really violence or revolutionary violence. That is insanity. And Fanon was saying, yeah, yeah, it's insanity from the pages of psychiatry. Right? We should understand that this thing has a cause in colonialism and imperialism, but we can add sexism and racism, which of course Fanon did as the causes. These are things that we should remove if we want to eliminate those kinds of violence. And I, I may not have answered it, but I am in the minority in reading Fanon this way. Almost everybody else sees him as an apostle of violence. I see him as a psychiatrist who is out to prevent violence by showing us what causes those violent actions. And then the Third question is about yeah yeah like abo survivor, isn't it? yeah yeah abolitionism abolitionism of or defunding of the police is not something that happens only in North America in Nigeria about the same time that we have the uh, Black Lives Matter movement we also had the and SARS movement in Nigeria. Police. These are police officers who are trained by Scotland Yard in London and armed to be rapid response units for <coughs> crime prevention in Nigeria. But they go out, if they see me with a phone like this, they say, I must be a criminal. How can I get a phone like this? Once I went home and they found me with a laptop and they say, oh, you must have stolen it. I said, no, it's, it's actually issued to me by my employers. It's part of my work. They said, no, we don't believe you. I said, come on, <laughs> why wouldn't you believe me? Eventually they let me go, but I was lucky. You know, a lot of kids end up killed because then they will steal your laptop and sell it. Or if they found you with a large amount of cash, they would kill you and take the money. So the, the young people, basically, we are the ones who led the end SARS movement, and they forced the government to say, okay, we're gonna end SARS, but what they did was simply give it a new name. Uh, right, so those young people then mobilized to support one of the candidates in the presidential election for uh, a candidate who represented the Labour Party. Uh, but I believe many of them were intimidated and couldn't go out to vote. There was a lot of violence people killed, ballots being snatched. And so they didn't, only 26% of the registered voters came out to vote. Imagine what would have happened if 90% came out to vote. And that didn't happen in that case. Now, I don't think that Chris Kunin is calling for the banning of the police because you might still need policing, maybe by the community or a civil type of police, but we don't need an army acting as a police in our communities. Maybe instead of giving police officers guns, they should be given smartphones, not to shoot people dead, but to shoot pictures that they could use as evidence, maybe for forgiveness, maybe for reparations, but not always for punishment. The prisons need to go, according to Angela Davis and W.B. Du Bois. That is called abolition democracy. It is relevant to every community 
around the world. Um, I think we're going to break now and if you have any uh, further questions for Dr. Agazino, I'm sure he would be happy to, to answer them. But uh, if you could just join me in an applause for such a brilliant presentation.